So um, psilocybin is potentially useful in depression, anxiety, hmm. uh, addiction, uh, anorexia nervosa, potentially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, post traumatic stress disorder, which is common. I mean, maybe just we can't do all of those, but maybe just focus down on, on addiction. Um, when when I was eighteen, uh, I can I, re I remember I won't tell you the names, but I remember the first two or three alcoholics I looked after. Hmm. Um, oh. mm -hmm. well, well, one of the first guy I looked after, and uh, you know, we got quite close relationships with these guys in those days. And, and I, I said to one guy, um, I'm sure you wouldn't mind me using his name. I know he wouldn't. Um, um, I, I won't. I won't use it. But um, we'll call him Brian. But yeah. I said, Brian, when when did you start drinking? At this stage, you'd be about 27, hopeless yeah. alcoholic. Mm -hmm. He said, well, John, I started when I was 19. I said, well, that's quite late. Yeah. He said, well, yes, at home we didn't drink. Um, uh, it, was a, it was a fairly religious household. They didn't drink at all. He went to university, first day at university, went to a party, had a few drinks, got drunk. And, th and then he said to me, but I tell you what, John, I was drunk again the day after. And, and from that point, I think he was an alcoholic, and he died when he was about 29. And... You know, several cases like that that I remember well. And, you know, the idea that we could have treated their addiction, is, is, that, is that fantasy or do you think these things could have really saved these young men's lives? Well, the answer is it could have done. So in the 1950s and early 60s, there were six trials of LSD in alcoholism. And basically they would putting people through an abstinence-based program, trying to stop them drinking. And some of them, half of them were roughly, got one LSD treatment and the other half didn't. And that, that data was kind of repressed and forgotten but, you know, and denied because of the ban. But about 10 years ago, two Norwegians went back and they actually got the source data, which was quite remarkable. And then they analysed it and they showed, well, LSD actually, <laughs> in those trials, had a, what we call an effect size, you know, it, it, in terms of the impact it had on the disorder, which is three times greater than, than any subsequent treatment we've had. And if you, so, so you think, well, hang on, so that, that was done in the 1960s. So let's, let's say 1970, LSD was banned, and we're now what? What are we? Um, we're 50, 55 years on, right? A couple of and generations, we, yeah. In, I've done a sort of back of the envelope calculation. So, it, probably on average, at least now it's three and a half million a year, but maybe back in the 70s it was. So, say it's two million a year people who've died prematurely, like your your patient from alcoholism. So, so what's that? You know, that's that's 120 million people have died prematurely. How many how many how many lives have been saved by banning LSD? Well, probably none. But I mean. A thousand, a million, it doesn't, I mean, the point is, the equation is so, so much in favour of the utility of it, that it's out, utterly outrageous that it's been banned, and, 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 and it didn't need to be, I mean, <laughs> yeah. they didn't ban morphine because people were using it, but they banned LSD because it was, because it was making people vote against the war. Yeah. And again, I can't condone this because it's a class A drug, but I've come across people recently who are addicted to alcohol and cocaine. Yeah. Uh, joint addiction in the same person. And they are completely off cocaine and have a couple of beers at the weekend, the same as most other people do. It's a very um, interesting thing you point out that that's really important, John, because people say, well, it can't be right. You only give one treatment. And they're better. And how can that be? Because we've been so conditioned I mean, to, the, to the model. You've got to take pills every day. So it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get the truth. What were the drive? What were the drivers for the ban? Now, my personal belief, it was, was largely political. But I think there was also another element. As the, 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 the modern pharmaceutical model began to be developed in the 19, early 1960s with the mipramine and chlorpromazine. Yeah. And of course, that is, a, that is a phenomenal economic model if you're selling a drug, because you take the drug every day. Whereas 
with psychedelics, you might just take it once in your life. And I, I think there was quite a bit of pressure from the pharma industry yes. trying to push... Certainly the pharma industry didn't oppose the ban, let's put it that way. Mm. I'm reminded of the Helicobacter pylori situation where... Yes. Um, you know, Tom Brody and Barry Marshall in Australia came up with the, this ludicrous idea that pepticulsis are caused by a bacteria where everyone knows they're caused by yeah. whatever it is, stress or whatever. Um, and, and at the time, I think the pharmaceutical industry at the time, I think, from memory, was selling $9 billion a year. And this must be in the early 90s. So $9 billion a year in the early 90s is a lot of money mm. of h2 blockers and later proton pump inhibitors and um they weren't very keen on on curing a condition no and the analogy is there because with a helicobacter pylori eradication you'd treat it for a couple of weeks i think it's a good be better. i think uh, yeah i think that's a great and i and the, and the way those guys really had to slave away to get anyone to take any notice yes so. Well, there was self-experimentation involved. Barry Marshall took it and took the helicobacter. So not that we're advocating that, but uh, no. there are self-experimenters around that, that we know.